Hi, everybody. Should we go ahead and get started? Um, it looks like we have a, I'm going to call this a quorum, so we're ready to go. Um, thank you all so much for coming. This is our first uh, event of this school year. My name is Barrett Berger, and I'm the director of the Center for the Advancement of Public Integrity, which we call CAPI, here at Columbia. Um, if you are not familiar with CAPI, I would very much encourage you to take a look at our website, learn a little bit more about us. Um, and more specifically, you should reach out to us. If you have an interest in issues of public integrity, corruption work, we are the place for you. We have a lot of pro bono projects. We have some that are listed on Simplicity. We have a lot of others that are in the works. Um, so you should definitely reach out to speak with us about um, doing some work with the center. Uh, we also have a full calendar of events for this year. We have another uh, event next Thursday. So today's event will be focused on corruption cases here in New York. And then next week, we'll take a look at some of the corruption cases and trends, investigations uh, nationwide. So if you're interested in this type of stuff, I urge you to um, come look at CAPI. I wanted to thank our co-sponsor, uh, SJI. I'm sure you're all familiar with the great work they do. Uh, if you are interested in government work, you should definitely reach out to Rachel Polly over there. She will give you amazing advice and point you in the right direction. Um, and I'm also happy to speak with you about some of that as well. Um, all right, I'd like to introduce our two panelists today. Um, first, I'd like to introduce you to um, Kern Ramey, uh, right here. She is a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, she covers courts and criminal justice in New York City. Uh, and given the steady stream of public corruption cases over the last few years, she's had a lot of work to do. Uh, she's covered cases um, ranging from Sheldon Silver, Dean Skelos, Joe Prococo, John Sampson, Pamela Harris, uh, and the bid rigging scandal uh, that was known as the Buffalo Billions. We're going to talk about a lot of those cases, and Corey will give us um, some great insight on that. Um, she also wrote a lot about the Supreme Court's decision after um, they vacated the conviction of former Virginia Governor Bob McDonnell and the impact of that ruling in New York. Um, when she's not covering public corruption cases, she does write other quirky stories on the journal's front page, including one about the social acceptance of eating an entire pint of ice cream, which I am happy to hear <laughs> is in fact socially acceptable. So, yay. Um, she holds a degree in viola performance and comparative literature from Oberlin College and journalism from Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. Um, sitting next to her is Professor Richard Rafalt, who I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. He is a professor here at the law school. Um, and his research writing and teaching focuses a lot on state and local government law, legislation, the law of political process, government ethics, and property. Did I get all the topics there? You got them. Okay. Uh, he's also a member of our board at CAPI. Um, he's the chair of the Conflict of Interest Board of New York City. And he was a former member of the New York State's Moreland Act Commission um, to investigate public corruption from 2013 to 2014. So that's enough hearing from me. Let's get started hearing from these guys. Um, I want to start by talking about a few of the most recent corruption cases that we had here in New York. Um, so last year, some of you may remember, there was a string of some lost trials and reversed convictions. And there was some that said this was sort of the death knell for public corruption cases. Um, and much of this came after this 2016 Supreme Court decision uh, that overturned the conviction of former Governor McDonnell uh, and really narrowed the legal, legal definition of corruption. So I want to start with you, Richard. Mm -hmm. Can you just give us a, a brief description of the um, McDonnell case and sort of how it affected our... Sure. And I think I'm going to stand up and move over and use the blackboard uh, in part oh. because uh, I can't not use the blackboard because my... I have to do something with my hands and there's no ice cream around, uh, <laughs> so I would do that. So um, the McDonald case, so most of these cases we're talking about are in some sense about bribery. Uh, the relevant federal laws deal with bribery, um, extortion, mail and wire fraud, which picks up something called theft of honest services. You can talk about what that means later. And then uh, one of the cases, the Buffalo Billion case, that uh, Corey's going to focus on, has the uh, wonderfully, if not satanically named, Section 666, uh, which is so-called federal funds corruption, what happens when a uh, state or local government that gets federal funds, uh, official involvement that is involved in bribery above a certain level. So all of these things, uh, or nearly all of them, involve the so-called quid pro quo. Um, 
um, let's call them the dry bore, not a technical term, um, gives money, money to somebody in government, and the government official uh, in turn does something for the bribe war. Sometimes the bribe war gives money to somebody else in whom the official, the person in government has an interest and that, they, that the person in government is interested in. Uh, for example, uh, the, one of the cases we'll talk about today involving the former state senate majority leader, the beneficiary was his son. Could be that benefits him since he doesn't have to support the kid anymore, but it was seen as him. The issue in the McDonald case, which had the potential to reframe federal corruption law, it's not quite clear that it has, and we can talk more about that, is to figure out what is it that is improper for a government official to do, what is to be, I'm running out of room here, to use the actual term, what's an official act? So McDonald's, the newly elected governor of Virginia, there's this man, Williams, he runs a business called Star Scientific. Uh, basically, he has this idea that you can do something with the nicotine and tobacco that will help treat, uh, take your, treat arthritis. And he has this vision in his company, you can do that. He would like the state of Virginia to help him out, the Commonwealth of Virginia to help him out with his research, because he doesn't have, a, he, he needs to get it funded, he needs to get to clear, get FDA approval. So he is looking for Virginia, a big tobacco state, uh, to use its uh, research, to use, find various ways, its universities and elsewhere, to help fund his work. Uh, and also, he at one point, he has an idea that maybe uh, his product can be picked up by the state's um, uh, government health insurance program for its state employees. So he starts working the governor-elect who becomes the governor. There are gifts. He buys the governor-elect's um, wife um, the gown that she's going to use at the inauguration. Basically, he floods the governor and the governor-elect uh, with funds, uh, $160,000, something like that. So there's clearly $160,000 going this way. He would like the governor to ultimately fund his work. Uh, I'm not sure this is on. It is on. To fund his work, the governor does a bunch of things. He has meetings with him. He tells one of his aides to have a meeting with him. He tells somebody at the, at the Virginia University system to have a meeting with him. He talks to the, somebody who's the head of the, the government insurance program to talk, think about it. He sponsors a luncheon at the executive mansion at which um, uh, Mr. Williams uh, is a guest. Um, there is a famous thing where he has one conversation with Williams and then within 12 minutes sends an email to one of his aides saying, look into this, which he has Williams for a loan. Uh, and Williams' response goes to trial, uh, corruption. Question is, what did the government have to prove in order to establish the corruption? They had to prove an official act. What's an official act? And amongst the things that the government listed were a bunch of the things that I said. Meetings, phone calls, uh, contacts with uh, senior state employees sponsoring the luncheon. And the question was, are each of those or any of those official acts? And the jury was charged that they could consider them. It didn't quite say that anything that a governor does is an official act, but it was all of these things that the governor was doing, having meetings with him, with Williams, or having phone calls, meeting with aides, talk about Williams, uh, talking to people in the government about Williams, uh, and sponsoring the luncheon. Were those the official acts? I should say, in the end, the state actually gave him absolutely nothing. Um, he, never got the, he never got the grant. He never got listed in the insurance program. The jury was charged that they could consider all these things to be official acts. And the Supreme Court's response unanimously was no. That's not quite right. The official act would be ultimately um, uh, actually granting him the research, uh, granting, giving him the research grant, or directing that he be included uh, in the insurance program. But that a meeting alone can't be an official act. The meeting could be part of the process leading to an official. It's a fairly subtle distinction. The meeting can be part of the process leading to the official act of approving a grant, signing a bill, uh, if, issuing a directive. But a meeting or a phone call uh, or a sponsored luncheon at the executive mansion is not by itself an official act. And so they concluded the jury instructions because 
it interferes too much in the ability of elected officials to do what elected officials do, which is meet with constituents and have public events. So there was a sense that it trenched too deeply into what elected officials do. So at that point, the, the, the Supreme Court reverses the conviction. He could have been retried, ultimately he was not. Uh, and that's what sort of shapes the cases that we're gonna talk about. Uh, two leaders, of the, wonderful coincidence, the two leaders of the New York State Legislature, the Speaker of the Assembly, uh, Sheldon Silver, a Democrat, Senate Majority Leader, Dean Skelos, a Republican, were both charged uh, within the same couple of months, right? Or at least yeah. within the same year, certainly a couple yeah. of months, with, in effect, taking, uh, well, in, in, in Skelos' case, more clearly extorting, uh, but demanding payments from uh, people who had business with the state government um, in order, um, de demanding payments for them in order for their state government business to go forward. Um, and Silver, something sim similarly, he was in effect charged with misusing his powers uh, to, in order to get for private gain. They were both convicted, but they were convicted under jury instructions which were issued, which were, um, I guess issued, which were, uh, the jury was instructed pursuant to instructions uh, that were written prior to McDonald in which in both cases, after both were convicted, in which in both cases the Second Circuit concluded that it was possible uh, that the jury concluded that specific, certain meetings or, or conversations were themselves the, the official act, as opposed to the official act being sponsoring a bill, voting for a bill, uh, putting something on the legislative agenda. So in both cases, uh, they were remanded for, the convictions were vacated, new trials were held, um, Silver was reconvicted. Has Skelos been retried again or is it uh, still pending? Yes, so they okay. were both convicted again and uh, Skelos will be sentenced next mm -hmm. week. Silver already got sentenced. Right, and he's now, uh, he just had his bail reduced and he's still out on bail, but he's... He's still out on bail. bail. He got bail pending yeah. appeal. Yeah. He has one more appeal yeah. on uh, a, um, another issue. Uh, there's another issue which, was, which is, looms large in federal corruption law, which was not the issue in any of these cases, which is... Uh, when you have the quid pro quo, how tight has the nexus got to be between the quid and the quo? Uh, the, the McDonald case and the uh, vacates and retrials in Silver and Skelos all turned on was there an official act. A meeting alone is not an official act. That's what comes out of this. A, the, the meeting could be part of a series of things which link up to be the official act of uh, 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 approving a bill but a meeting is not an official act anymore. Um, but the other issue latent in this is often there's not an express, I will give you this if you will give me that, but uh, what's sometimes called the retainer theory, or the, um, uh, well, retainer theory is probably the best way of describing it. The, um, the giver uh, provides a series of gifts with the goal that ultimately the official does something, and the official knows that. Uh, but there's no, there's never at one point a deal that says, here's $50,000 if you sign that bill. Uh, and so there is a silver seeking one more round on saying the various things that benefits that I got, they were never that tightly tied to um, the things that I did. And that's, I think, the focus thing. Corey, maybe I can ask you. So we know that McDonald was not retried. Why were... Skelos and Silver, why were there retrials in that case? Um, well, I can talk a little bit about Silver. You don't have to stand if you don't. Or I actually used to use this, actually. I realized I should was bouncing around with that. All right. Works. Okay. Um, they were retried because, so the, when those convictions, when the Second Circuit vacated both convictions, the court was pretty clear that the evidence was strong in both Silver and Skelos. And so then it becomes up to prosecutors if they want to retry the cases. And prosecutors very, very quickly said that they would retry in both cases. And, you know, as somebody who observed the cases, mm -hmm. both the initial ones and then the retrials, you know, did things change dramatically or is it really just the jury charge that, that changed? So the jury charge was definitely different. And I, um, I printed out part of the jury charge here. And it's so explicitly referring to um, McDonald. It says, uh, so it's talking about official acts and says the decision or action must be made on a question or matter that involves a formal exercise of government power. That means that the question or matter must be specific, focused, and concrete. Uh, and it also says it must be something, and it says that it can't just be a meeting. Like it sort of references what mm -hmm. Richard was saying. 
But otherwise, the retrials weren't so different. Um, they were very short and very focused. I think you had the sense that both sides sort of knew what the core of their argument was and didn't need some of the, the witnesses and the ideas that were kind of on the margins. But the biggest difference was, um, or actually, can I talk about Skelos and explain Please, it a yeah. little bit? And then I can explain what was different. Um, so Skelos, as Richard mentioned, was really about sort of a dad wanting to help his son, that Dean Skelos adopted a son and this, and was sort of like the predominant figure in this kid's life. The mother wasn't around and they had this really close relationship. But this son was just really, really troubled as he got older. He had a drinking problem. He didn't do well in school. He couldn't seem to hold down a job. And so even when the son was, you know, in his 30s, Dean was helping him out and trying to get him jobs. And from Dean's perspective, he was just doing what he did, talking to his powerful friends who happened to be real estate developers and people like that. And he ended up getting his son, I guess, either a no-show or a low-show job, depending on your perspective, and getting various payments to help him out. And this is like a little bit more of a, a human story than Silver. Silver's a little bit more transactional in that he was essentially getting paid. Um, and so in the first Skelos trial, Dean did not take the stand. And in the second one, he testified. And he was really, really good. Like he was, uh, like when I went to go hear him, it was like you kind of believed him. Like you kind of believed like, oh, there's this nice guy and he just wants to help his son and he's such a nice dad. I mean, he's doing things that are like pretty blatantly illegal, but you sort of felt it. And you sort of, at least being there and knowing the jury are these regular people who are, I don't know, maybe sympathetic parents. I kind of wondered if maybe he would be successful, although ultimately he was not. So I think that was the major difference. Right. That's interesting. Um, so uh, t maybe we'll move away a little bit from Skelos and Silver unless, you know, if somebody has actually a specific question on Skelos or Silver, we could ask that now. Um, if not, I'll, we can come back and ask questions at the end. Um, but I want to make sure we have time to talk about another big corruption case uh, that came down this year, um, which was at Percoco. Uh, this, I think, maybe got less public attention in certain spheres, but I think is, is incredibly important. And maybe, Corey, you could start with just giving us a little bit of the factual background of Percoco. Yeah. Um, so I guess sort of as I imagine you guys aren't necessarily from New York, and I don't know how much you know about Albany, but to back up a step, like, there are so many political corruption cases here. It's not just the ones that we're talking about. And they just sort of, I cover courts and criminal justice generally, and they just sort of pop up everywhere. I was um, at a event for people, it was like getting people who had been in prison and were on parole to vote. And so everybody who was there had been in prison. And I was listening to the people in the audience and this guy gets up and it's this assembly member named William, William Scarborough. And I was thinking, oh, there's this random assembly member here. I'm not going to quote him in the story because this is really a story about you know, former inmates. And then I got back to work, and I was thinking about it, and I realized, oh, yeah, he was in prison. Like, just because he's an assembly member doesn't mean he wasn't in prison. And he had been convicted of some uh, like corruption scheme. So it's everywhere. But I think most of the cases are, are more like William Scarborough in that they're, lawmak or they're lawmakers. They're like either state senators or state assemblymen. And what was really different about Prococo was, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that case is thought of as the first time that these kind of accusations and indictments touch the executive branch. Because Prococo is a really, he's really uh, close to Cuomo. He was his campaign manager when he, uh, Cuomo ran for AG and also for governor a couple times. And it was sort of this really close family friend. I think Mario Cuomo called him my father's second son, is the famous quote. So the fact that this kind of, uh, there were now accusations of corruption so close to Cuomo was seen as very significant and different. And what um, was sort of the nature of the scheme that was at issue in Prococo? So in Prococo, um, there was this, 
so there were a couple different schemes. The main scheme was another one of these kind of low show job things that there was an energy company that created a, a no show job for Prococo's wife. And this was seen as sort of creating payments for Prococo. Um, and this, the, so there's these two cases, Prococo and Buffalo Billions, and the cases were brought at the same time. Buffalo Billions was a uh, bid rigging case, and then the trials ended up being severed. Like there were two separate trials for these. There were multiple defendants in both trials. Um, and so Prococo was, he was charged with taking bribes, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and uh, he was ultimately convicted, and he was convicted in the Southern District, right? He was, um, and got sentenced recently, and he's appealing, so we'll see. So one thing that was notable to me is the jury took a really long time um, when they were deliberating on the Prococo case. Um, and I'm curious if you think that was, again, after watching the trial, you know, should we read anything into that? Do you think the jurors were struggling with whether or not this was going too far? Or what do you think? I mean, I guess I'm hesitant to read too far into anything a jury does. Like I often, sometimes I try to because I'm sitting around a courtroom and I'm waiting and I'm thinking if this jury would just decide then I could go home and, <laughs> or I could go back to work or do something else besides sit around. And whenever I make guesses about these things, I feel like I'm normally wrong. But I do think, so Prococo happened in the general same time period as um, uh, Mangano. I don't know if, who is this uh, former, uh, former big guy in uh, county Nassau executive. County. county. Yeah, county executive. <laughs> And that jury also took a really long time, and they said they were deadlocked. And I think sort of in general, without knowing what was going on in the jury room, I do feel like these cases are tricky for jurors. And I think part of that is because knowing what counts as a bribe and sort of whether there's, I mean, you were talking about this before, this sort of implicit or explicit agreements and how much of this is sort of how government operates and how much is actually a bribe because it's not so clear. It's not like I say, um, you know, Richard, I'm going to give you this water bottle and you're going to give me a pizza in exchange and that's our secret deal and let's like have a secret handshake. Like it's just not so clear. Very few of these cases today are direct payments by the, the, bribe, the private party into the bank account or the hands of the government official. Uh, the, uh, McDonald was unusual, and that's what was happening, but the issue was what was the government official doing in response. More commonly, it's more complicated, uh, partly because, um, well, sometimes because they know that's a clear-cut bribe, but if it goes to a third party, like the public official's spouse or child, uh, it's a little less clear, or if it goes to the public official's law firm, um, and, the public and it then ultimately goes into the public official's draw from the law firm, because, at least for the legislators, they're not barred from having law firms. So, or if it's going to, well, that's sort of, so, so part of it is the complexity of where, it, of who, who's getting the money, and even sometimes figuring out what the actions are. So one of the things that Prococo was charged with doing was exerting his behind the scenes influence on various other state agencies to get them to do things or not do things that were affecting the activities of private developers. So again, so the, it's called the Buffalo Billions in part because the governor, Buffalo Billion, I think, well, the governor, so as you may know, upstate New York is a relatively economically depressed compared to the rest of the state uh, and compared to its own back history. So the governor basically said, we're going to pump a lot of money into upstate. Well, ultimately, it, it's the, it gets run through various ac organizations and activities. In some cases, they're public entities like uh, State University of New York, the Polytechnic, which they're, they're going to do something. Sometimes it's more private. Sometimes it's hybrid. We have a lot of hybrid things like the Empire State Development Corporation. And they then let contracts. And then the contractors have to do things. And sometimes the contract, and sometimes it goes into the terms of the contract letting, like is the contract, and is, the, is the RFK, be going to be written so that only one contractor right. is eligible. Or in one of the things involving Prococo, one of the contractors uh, was told by the state relevant state agency that you have to enter into a certain kind of labor agreement 
which was costly. They didn't want to do that. Contractor contacts Prococo to get Prococo to use his unofficial influence to contact the state agency to tell them to no longer require the labor agreement. So the beneficiary is the uh, contractor. They don't pay, they're not getting any money out of it exactly, but the costs of complying with the contract are reduced through this indirect intervention. Well, this is all the allegations uh, with the state agency. So they're complicated. They, it's not like the, somebody put, you know, gave them money. Um, but it was that the, the rules were made easier for them to make their money. And is that when you read in articles, you'll hear, I feel like you see the term pay to play yeah. a lot. Is that sort of the concept that they're trying to get at with that? Yeah, it's about influencing government action. And sometimes, more commonly pay to play is actually used in the context of campaign finance, of campaign contributions or campaign expenditures, rather than this outright personal payment, but it certainly picks it up. Um, you know, that that's what you get, and um, yeah. All right, I wanna, you, you did some oh, good artwork there. Right, I want to tell you about my artwork, but I also yeah. want to ask Richard a question yeah. that I'm curious about. Um, so on the subject of these not being so direct, it's not yeah. just like handing someone something and getting money back. So Silver, he was just really, really powerful in state politics. He was speaker for 20 years from the Lower East Side. So he got... He gave state grants to Dr. Taub, who's a mesothelioma researcher. Uh, to, because, yeah. because he couldn't literally give the state grant, no, but he could certainly he direct it. That's true. Right. The state actually has to give it. It's in the budget. He right. used his power exactly. Absolutely. to make right. sure right. Right. that these grants would get direct, directed to Dr. Taub. And Dr. Taub would, because mesothelioma uh, patients can sue and can also, these cases can be worth a lot of money. Uh, referred patients to a particular law firm, and this law firm, Silver, was associated with. In New York, we have a part-time legislature, meaning that you are, in fact, allowed to have other jobs on the side, and people do have other jobs on the side. And so Silver's other job was, uh, I think he was of counsel at mm -hmm. the, the like firm, that, yeah. and it was unclear how much work he did, but he was associated <laughs> with it. Um, anyway. So the referrals went to the firm, and then Silver did not work on these particular cases, but he, got, but the firm then gave him $3 million total over the time of this case in referral fees. So it's not like Dr. Taub ever gave Silver any money directly. It was sort of this, uh, I guess, workaround. Yeah. That's interesting. Richard, um, can you talk a little bit about Jacob? And I, sure. my guess is not a lot of people here maybe sure. even know what Jacob is and sort of how that fits into right. this all just, of this scheme here. Two, two, two asterisks on this one. Yeah, diagram. Yes. One is Dr. Tao was at Columbia. Uh, he was a researcher uptown at part of Columbia University, and he got into some trouble with Columbia as well from this, uh, and there was some litigation about that. Um, um, the other thing is the stuff that uh, Dr. Tao researched at mesothelioma, a lot of the cases actually came out of 9-11. So Silver was able to say that he was actually doing this on behalf of his constituents, because Silver's the Lower East Side, I think, mm -hmm. actually, yep. Um, um, the World Trade Center was actually in his district. If not, it was extremely close. So he also, and often there's an argument that I would have done it anyway. Uh, the other issues that he was involved was in real estate, and he was getting certain money involved for supporting a certain tax abatement for certain real estate development, as was Skelos. And the argument is also, I was going to do this anyway. It didn't influence me uh, because I was going to support this research. It's not quite true here because at some point, um, well, it was the other way around. They stopped funding Dr. Taub and Dr. Taub stopped referring, making referrals to the law firm. But there is often, not always, and even going back to Governor McDonnell in Virginia, his claim was always Virginia economic development. I was dealing with these business people. There's ways of finding new, new jobs for uh, Virginia. So there's often, not always, but often there's going to be a fig leaf of public justification. And even the Buffalo Billion. It was good for it was going to be pumping money into upstate New York, pumping development. Can I actually ask you a question? Yeah, sure. We'll get to Jacob. But okay. Yeah. okay. Um, Buffalo we'll Billion. So yeah. one of the things with Buffalo Billion is the case kind of shrunk, like um, particularly in the initial indictment, mm -hmm. there were charges about campaign donations that the developers in Buffalo Billion had given donations to Cuomo, and they had sort of this expectation of what they would give back. 
And by the time it went to trial, prosecutors had dropped those particular charges. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on why or sort of why that would be okay. so hard to prove. I don't know that case in particular, but there, there is this. So we talk about quid pro quo. Um, in sort of general federal bribery prosecution, there is some recognition that that can be loosened and that you have this retainer theory where there's a sense of that you can, the, you can find a bribery situation where the, the, I'll call him the donor, the giver, is giving money as a way of building a relationship, maybe with an idea that eventually we're going to need some laws in this area, we're going to need a grant, we're going to need to be put in the budget, but without saying, I'm giving this to you because I want to get that budget line. Um, and the courts will say, as long as the, the if you prosecute, you can prosecute, you can also prosecute the giver or the receiver separately, and you can actually uh, corrupt, uh, prosecute the giver for corrupt giving without prosecuting the receiver, and you could prosecute the receiver for corrupt receiving without necessarily prosecuting the giver. So they're technically different because they have different states of mind. Um, in, when it's a campaign contribution, the Supreme Court has said the connection has to be tighter because, and that makes, it makes sense in the following way, there is no public interest in people giving money to elected officials. It's not always illegal, uh, although some states have created restrictions or bans on gifts. But you can, there's no, it's, it may be a bad idea, but if you could want to give an elected official money, um, it's not always, it's not necessarily legal, it may not necessarily be a good idea. I think it's, we could be neutral about it, or we could be nervous about it and develop prophylactic rules like gift bans. Elected officials, at least, need money to run for office. So there is a First Amendment interest in giving money, not to them personally, but to giving money to their campaigns. And technically, campaign contributions don't go to the official, they go to a campaign account. And the official, in theory, is not supposed to be able to use the campaign account for personal business, although sometimes that's violated. Um, so the Supreme Court, in a case called uh, Evans in the 1990s, basically said, yes, you can prosecute campaign co contributions as bribes, but the nexus between the, the giving and the anticipated official response has to be more express or explicit. They use both words, and there is an entire literature as to whether express and explicit, explicit mean the same thing or not. And believe it or not, there are cases that go into that. So I'm guessing that maybe they couldn't make it tight enough from the campaign contribution, but um, I don't really know. Yeah. Can I okay. speak to that just particularly? Yeah. 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 Point? So just for the audience on that, my name is John Caney. I'm from reInvent All of England. Mm -hmm. We're one of the main anti-corruption groups in the United States. We follow this very closely. In this particular Buffalo Billion case, in case you didn't follow it, the company, LP Simonelli, that was at the center of the trial, built a $750 million factory using state funds for what's now Tesla. LP Simonelli was Cuomo's largest campaign contributor in Western New York. So it wasn't just anybody. During the time when the contract was under consideration for building this, they held two fundraisers so the timing, if you look at the mm -hmm. timeline of the contract period, consideration period, the RFP, and when the, um, when their their big benefit parties were held, were right in the exact mm -hmm. same window. So I mention that because it it shows you how hard it is to use, um, you know, what we call legal bribery or pay to play um, to yeah. use campaign contributions, despite the fact that to any common sense observer they would be like, oh, that's interesting, and given the fact that the contributions from this particular donor, the builder of this factory, skyrocket during the RFP period. It's not like they were giving tons of money and then this just happened. It's They are giving some money and then it's, wow, look at that. And similarly, in the Buffalo Billion trial, the other firm that was on trial for development from Syracuse uh, was Cuomo's largest campaign contributor in central New York, also during the contract period. And so it's, it's a, you know, I, I know that The Supreme Court has even said it's okay if they influence behavior. Indeed, we kind of expect that. It's only improper when it's really tight, when they influence a very specific thing. And so the Supreme Court has actually said influence from campaign contributions is actually okay, uh, or, and certainly rewarding people 
who you agree with, I mean, that is okay. It's, they've, you know, they, they basically have said, though, that the nexus has to be much tighter. And you can, and they may have been able to prove it, I, who knows, but they may have decided they could get enough done without it. So yeah. this is less a defense and more just a sense of, um, it's super tight because at least there's a, an alternative justification for campaign finance, campaign contributions, which doesn't really exist for other kinds of private benefits. On JCO, uh, that's the Joint Committee on Public Ethics. Ethics? Okay. So one of the um, um, <coughs> Achilles heels weak areas in the American government system, we have many, um, is the oversight of the political process and of politicians itself. Uh, we might be able to get it together and create every now and then something strong like the SEC to oversee the uh, securities industry, although it doesn't always work that way, but it's harder to create so an entity that effectively oversees the political process, um, uh, including uh, elections and government ethics. Um, because these are things that the elected officials themselves create to oversee themselves. So there is a uh, natural temptation to not be that effective or to be, a, a particular, or to be a, very attentive to the people being overseen. And often they're quite politicized. So they tend to have two forms. One is it's really politicized and dominated by the dominant party. And you see this more in the elections domain where we're seeing right now the fight going on in Georgia because the chief elections officer in Georgia happens to be also the Republican candidate for governor. Um, and it's, it's, Georgia's not unique in having the chief elections officer of the state either elected on a partisan line or appointed by a partisan official, the governor. And so it's also that the chief elections officer of Kansas is also the Republican candidate for governor. So, and, and certainly the Georgia, uh, and he was going to be in charge, the, uh, <coughs> charge of overseeing the recount in his own primary which he won by 120 votes. Uh, and now there are accusations against the Secretary, the, the uh, Secretary of State of Georgia that he has blocked the acceptance of something like 50,000 new registrations of people who it may be thought would be voting against him. So there's the problem on the election side. And uh, the alternative is to create something which is toothless or extremely <coughs> hard to get going uh, by making it very bipartisan and having all sorts of checks and balances. So, on the one hand, it can't be very abusive. On the other hand, it can't get much done. That's kind of the Federal <coughs> Elections Commission, which is uh, not quite, but almost unique amongst federal agencies in having six members, uh, which means three, three ties are common. Uh, and they're all point on partisan lines. Uh, or the New York State Board of Elections, which is a four member board constitutionally by the state, two Democrats and two Republicans, which means again, it's very hard for it to be effective in dealing with issues of misconduct or to be particularly aggressive. JCOP falls into the second category. So JCOP is an entity, it's, I don't know, the second or third <coughs> go-round in the past decade in which the legislature being prodded by outside scandals and the governor, I forget, I think it might have been still Spitzer, was it uh, Patterson, um, prodded by outside scandals, tried to recreate a new entity with oversight over the state legislature as well as the rest of the state government. So they created a 14-member body uh, split up amongst different appointing bodies, like the governor, uh, the state legislature, the different chambers of the state legislature, upper and lower house, and the different party conferences in the state legislature, so that it works out that if you want to bring, a, if they want to make a finding, and in the end they have to refer it back to the legislature for penalty, but if you want to make a finding against a member of the state legislature, the vote can be 11 to 3 in favor of the finding of a violation, and it fails because you need to have at least one vote from that legislator's party conference in that chamber of the legislature. So let's say the claim is being brought against a Democrat in the state Senate. At least one Democrat in the state Senate has to vote for bringing forward the claim. If all of them vote against it, then although every, everybody else on the, on the commission, including the Democrats in the Senate, and the gubernatorial appointees vote for, it fails. So that, among other reasons, I mean, and no one, of course, knows the inside of what's happening, but JCOP is not structured to be an effective watchdog agency, uh, and it's gotten a lot of criticisms for not. Without commenting on any specific case, it is not structured to do that. But again, 
coming up with the right structure of an agency which is going to be effective but not partisan is hard. Uh, and um, I'd like to say that my agencies achieve that. Uh, but it, it's easier in a city in which is largely one party so that the party divide doesn't loom very large. Um, but it's hard to do. And did Jake Hope, did they weigh in on you know, Silver and Skelos? Did they, you know, were they at all effective in trying I to identify this? I think they were post this? most of the scandals, but I'm not sure. I don't think they did. Uh, but I don't, I don't think they did. I don't did, think they but, did either. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I don't. And, and I mean, technically, it oversees the whole state government, I think. But mm -hmm. and then we have other things. There are there are there are, you know, inspectors, and it also is a general problem of why. Are, another question you might have asked is, um, Skelos, uh, Silver, Percoco, Calieros, the head of uh, SUNY Poly, uh, why are these all in, why are these all federal cases? Um, and again, uh, not to say that federal justice is necessarily uh, nonpartisan, um, but, um, or, and um, uh, also McDonald. Mm -hmm. But the New York State DAs are all elected on partisan lines. And they all, as Jennifer knows, get campaign contributions. Uh, and so it's actually, the, the who will guard the guardians bit is very hard uh, as to who actually can bring, who do we want, who do we trust can bring enforcement actions. Almost all of the, the scandals that you've, uh, yeah. that Corey's talked about, all the state legislators, I think, if not all, then nearly all, were prosecuted federally, right? Have we yeah. seen state prosecutions of, of state um, officials? We've seen the uh, state attorney general's office have some prosecutions, but they tend to be kind of lower level. They're not figures like this. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So just on that, the state yeah. attorney general's office I mean, I'm actually going to stand up for the other prosecutors' offices just slightly. <laughs> yeah, at Eastern District has had a bunch of Shirley Huntley. Yeah, yeah. Shirley Huntley, Pamela Harris, Boyman. John Sampson. <laughs> yeah, there have actually been a lot coming out of Eastern District, um, and some is where these lawmakers are. And we just saw last week a case coming out of Western of another lawmaker, another bribery oh, yeah. case. Is that Chris Collins, the congressman? No, no. this is, I'm going to say his name wrong, it's Joseph Arrigo. Mm -hmm. You look like you want to yeah, chime in. Yeah, I was going to chime in as a former member of the Public Integrity Bureau at the New York Yankees office, that what, what they would say is, that There's also some, I'll write two more points on that. One is that I think at least the case law in New York State, um, state case law on bribery does require a tighter connection than I think the federal case law. Does. I think there's at least one court of appeals case that does that. And the other, I think, is procedurally, um, New York State does not um, allow use immunity. In other words, when you uh, have a, when you want to get somebody who may have been part of the problem on your side, there's different ways of immunizing them. You can have a, 
uh, a limited immunity or a broader immunity. And the federal prosecutors have more discretion as to the immunity tools they have. Uh, New York State doesn't have it. And so the DAs have long complained. Uh, it goes actually back to first Governor Cuomo. There was the, the DAs have had a, a wish list of things they could do to make it easier for them to bring prosecutions. And I think that's been near the top of the list. And they still haven't gotten it. But again, that goes back to the state legislature. Because in order to get to change the rules governing uh, either to, to, I guess the Court of Appeals could change its rules about what's a bribe, but it would be easier to rewrite the statute. Uh, in order to change the rules of criminal procedure, you need the state legislature, which has, it seems to have been in a hurry to make it easier. Yeah, that too is a, another question I was going to ask you know, for the first time. For the first time in, the, in a long time, it may be the case that we have Democrats taking control of the state Senate. Um, does anyone think that if that happens, we actually have a hope of ethics reform, which, of course, has not happened over the course of many, many years, in part because the governor hasn't pushed it as hard as he could, but in part because the Republicans who were controlling the state Senate wouldn't let any of those things through. Anyone optimistic about uh, ethics reform at the state level if we finally get uh, Democrats in charge of the Senate? I'll like half answer that question, I guess. Um, I'm never too optimistic of things happening in government in New York State, but you never know. But I think also there's sort of these other things at play here, and some of this is the culture of Albany, that sort of this has been the way things have worked for so long that I don't know if ethics reform, if that happens, can change culture. And then I think secondly, this part-time legislature thing is an issue too because so lawmakers make 80,000 a year or like 79,500 plus there's ways to get, you get sort of per diems and extra money for being what in charge of a committee or in right, charge right, of these other things. Right. And some lawmakers say, you know, in my district on the Upper East Side, 80,000 doesn't go that far. So of course I need these other jobs and in other places in the state too that that's just not enough money and that would having lawmakers not have side jobs I mean that's really the source of a lot of these cases not all of them but that would be a pretty substantial difference if that were ever to change just a slight again on that yeah the, the, the whole concept of full-time and part-time is a little bit um it's kind of a label we put on it's not that they're full-time or part-time it's just it's what their salary is uh, in other words, they're paid a certain salary. There's no, they sort of meet uh, several days a week for about half the year, and then they meet intermittently, but they say they also have committee meetings. So it's not officially part-time part -time or full-time, but they get a certain salary, 79 something or other. It hasn't been raised since the year 2000. Um, they have, they do get, right, the, if you're a committee chair or a vice chair, you get something extra. There was all sorts of corruption with respect to the, to a, a bunch of Democratic state senators who said they were committee chairs and they really weren't and the controller didn't want to, didn't want to pay, it was to deal with their vouchers. Um, the proposal that's been floating around for a long time is to give them a big pay increase and then either bar or tightly limit outside income, which is what the city council does. City council members are paid much more than that. But there is now a fairly tight, either tight limit or a complete bar, I forget, but a very tight limit. Sim similarly with members of Congress. Members of Congress have a real salary, um, and then there's a 15% cap on what they can earn outside. Now, you sometimes get things like what happened with Congressman Collins. He didn't violate the, the, the outside earnings cap. He just made a lot of investments uh, and was, was using inside information and doing that. So sometimes the pushback on the cap on outside uh, income is it's a cap usually on outside earned income, uh, like a, and it's harder to figure out what to do with investments uh, and uh, things like that. But that would be this idea has been kicking around for a long time. Of, but it would require the politically unpopular thing of probably doubling their salaries, uh, and then say no more, or uh, no more plus ten percent, or something like that. Are there other questions? We have a few more minutes. I want to make sure I get everyone's questions. Sure, go ahead. First of all, thanks for coming. I was wondering if you could talk about uh, the senator from our sister state, Bob Menendez, and the theory that some people have said that at this point, if you are a federal official who is even moderately intelligent and patient, you can essentially completely get away with it, both in the sense of legally and in the sense that Bob Menendez is still, you know, is still the Democratic candidate for Senate coming up. You want to take that, Corey? Or? 
Yeah, so just to be clear, the question is, can you basically just get away with it? <laughs> yeah, with Menendez being like the, the case of appointment. I mean, Collins thinks he can, yeah. so do you guys know who Chris Collins is? He's the senator from upstate New York. Con sorry, Congressman Collins, who uh, got indicted for insider trading. And he's running, and I went to his court date, I guess, last week, and they were scheduling the trial, and it was sort of taken for granted. It was weird. It was like it was taken for granted that he would win again, and the uh, Southern District prosecutors were trying to make sure that the trial got scheduled before November 2020, which is the next election from now. So they were like, of course he's going to win, but let's not have him win another term. Right. So I guess in some ways, yeah, it is taken for granted. But I do, like on the Menendez well, thing. I have two things on Menendez. One relates to Corey's <laughs> earlier point about yeah, juries. And in the Skelos case, the pulling on the heartstrings about the sun. The, thing that made, the two things made Menendez tricky. One, so Menendez, the senator from New Jersey, um, he's accused basically of two very different kinds of things. Um, but one of them in particular was uh, helping out his pal, his pal, Dr. Menglin. Um, who is uh, an ophthalmologist based in Florida. He's the guy who's showering. He's the source of all the, the, the money coming in, uh, the free trips to the Dominican Republic, the free trips to Paris, uh, campaign contributions, very wealthy man. He was in some trouble with the Department of Health and Human Services with respect to the reimbursements for certain services he performed to the tune of about $8 million. Um, and um, so uh, Menendez is kind of lobbying the secretary to go easy. On him and making some substance policy arguments about uh, the, Dr. Menglin was being caught on, a rule, on rules that hadn't been clarified. Um, two things. One is Menglin was his pal. Uh, they were both from the Dominican Republic. They were both old friends. And so one of the arguments to the jury was that he wasn't doing it for the money. He was doing it for his friend, and he would do it for a friend. And that gets into the how do the juries process the motive. Um, and was it really just, you know, I'm doing it for my friend? And that, that, I think, complicated it. The other is more the McDonald issue. What was, um, what was uh, Menendez doing? Con constituent service lobbying a public official. Was that an official act? When he calls, for, he calls the secretary a couple of times, she in the end doesn't follow it. She, she basically takes the meeting because she's the secretary and he's a senator. But in the end, they go ahead with the with 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 uh, cutting with uh, seeking the the refund, the eight million dollar refund. So she takes the meeting because you do that with a senator. Is that this may or may not be the kind of thing the McDonnell case meant to say isn't an official act? And I think that's where the government had a hard time. And the other thing he did involved again something that Dr. Menglin was involved in a a, a business venture in the Dominican Republic, which. Um, would have benefited by certain actions from the State Department. And so there was a public hearing, uh, a Senate hearing, of which uh, Menendez participated, in which he kind of, I don't know, uh, I forget whether he tongue or at least interrogated the relevant State Department official. Yeah, he was there in his official capacity, but he wasn't voting on anything, he wasn't moving legislation or not. I think Menendez, more than the cases we've talked about, show some of the difficulties of the McDonnell case. Um, whereas I think um, um, Collins, it was actually less a, it was a, it, the fact that he was a congressman was almost happens. I mean, it, that was what got him the information, but it's not a bribery case. Uh, it's an insider trading case. I forget what's going on with Duncan Hunter, the, the guy in Southern California who's similarly been indicted. Yeah, but I, use of oh, that was a, that's right, that was the personal use of campaign funds, but yeah. But I mean, I also think these are questions for voters. Yeah. And what we've seen, and what we saw with, uh, I think, particularly Prococo, is I think people like, you know, like reporter people and people in this world are sort of like, oh, this is so bad for Cuomo. But then at the end of the day, like in polls and with voters, like it just doesn't seem to stick. And people who went to the trial, like there's all this distasteful conduct and sort of clubbiness of this atmosphere inside the administration. But at the end of the day, like, the guy did really well in the Democratic primary, and he's going to be governor again. And I think we see that in general. The voters may not care. Well, Menendez much. is in deep trouble. He is in deep trouble. From what I see, Menendez first, might yeah. lose in a very, very blue state. And if he does win, it's going to be very narrow. Uh, he seems to be. He seems to have been hurt by this. He's uh, got some other problems too, though. Well, there is that too. There was yes. Go ahead. 
Um, let's see, that one, <laughs> one thing is that somehow there's prostitutes involved in way too many of these cases, <laughs> including that one. Um, I mean, I think in some ways that's a little bit different. It's a little bit different than these elected lawmaker type cases, but it's another kind of public corruption kind of case. The NYPD is a public agency and we have an expectation that they don't behave don't behave that way um but what do i make of it i don't know i sure it falls within the boundaries of like bribery and the honest services fraud statute is meant to prohibit i mean i think it's tricky because i think like in general a lot of the conduct we're talking about there's this question about like we we think it's all distasteful, but where the line is between something being distasteful, like just distasteful, and then crossing that line into illegal, I think that's sort of the larger question here. And whether that particular conduct crosses that line, I don't know. I mean, I'm going to go to some of the trial and maybe ask me afterwards, and then I may have a better answer. Well, I think we are at time, but thank you guys so much for coming out, and please come next Thursday when we'll be talking about some of these issues on a national scale. Thank you guys so much.